Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank you for coming to the first ever Cardiac Amyloid Research Seminar Series. I'm Sandesh Dave at Arizona State University. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, the Arizona Biomedical Research Center, uh, which is a funding from the state of Arizona to bring together national and local experts to engage Arizona researchers and clinical professionals on emerging topics um, to, for the research community. The goal here is to foster collaboration among researchers and clinicians and to encourage networking. So I'm really excited about this event. Um, how did we get here? Um, we had our first ever CME event in January of, of this year, and uh, we had a really good turnout for what you know we knew was a relatively new emerging topic. And we're really excited by all of the enthusiasm and engagement of people here in the Valley and in Arizona, and even audience um, in, you know, nationally. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to thank April Johnson, who's my colleague and project coordinator, uh, for amazing eye to detail and organization in planning this event. So, um, you know, this is an exciting time in amyloid. Um, we have new therapies, we have uh, drug approvals, we have clinical trials in development, um, we have improvements in imaging, um, we have a focus on health equity, and we have concerns about healthcare value. So, I think this is a really um, great opportunity to dive into some of this. Um, and I think that the transformation um, with this, this new innovation will require really a village approach uh, in the medical community. And so um, that's necessary to change practices and beliefs. And so we think this debate is going to be a great opportunity to engage a variety of stakeholders from cardiology, primary care, and geriatrics. So I wanted to introduce uh, the debaters today. Um, <clears throat> So uh, we have our um, we have our pro team um, that yes amyloid uh, screening should happen for all um, adults older than 65 with heart failure. So we have Dr. Suzanne Soroff. Um, <clears throat> she is a she graduated from medical school from Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, she did a year of research in congestive heart failure. She did her cardiology fellowship at Metro Health Hospital. Um, she's been practicing in Arizona since 2007, and she was the president of the American Heart Association local chapter and has been on the ACC board of directors. Um, she's also faculty at Creighton University with interest in pulmonary hypertension, cardio-oncology, and women's health. And I have to say, I learned that she's been to more states um, during her training than I have, so that's um, a major honor. Um, and then to her left is uh, Dr. Michael Castro, um, who's a founder of Arrowhead Internal Medicine, board certified in internal medicine, associate program director of the internal medicine residency at Abrazo Health Network, uh, assistant professor at Creighton School of Medicine. Um, he's also professor at uh, at least three or four other medical schools. Um, He's chief of staff at Abrazo Arrowhead uh, Campus in Abrazo, um, Arizona Heart Hospital uh, until August 2020. Um, and he graduated from University of Puerto Rico Medical Science Campus in 1994 and did internal medicine residency at Maricopa Medical Center. And like me, he's a fan of Lynn manuel Miranda. Um, and to my left, um, the, um, the naysayers, um, <clears throat> we have Dr. Uh, Nimith Agarwal, uh, Director of Division of Geriatric Medicine, uh, Program Director of the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship, Clinical Associate Professor in Internal Medicine at U of A College of Medicine, Phoenix, and President of the Arizona Geriatric Society. Um, in his free time, he develops smart protocols and um, technologies to uh, innovate in care uh, around delirium, um, and he helped uh, Banner become a geriatric emergency department and age-friendly health system. And to his left is Dr. Ambar Andrade, uh, Director of Cardiomyopathy and Recovery at Banner University Medical Center, Associate Clinical Professor at University of Arizona. She's an advanced heart failure cardiologist with a focus on recovery. 
Uh, she trained at Northwestern Memorial, Texas Heart, Washington University. Um, and uh, most recently, she was at Advocate Christ in Illinois. And she has survived two summers in Arizona and looking forward to more. <laughs> All right. And so your, uh, your hosts for this evening are Dr. Chris Vijay, uh, who's been instrumental in helping to plan some of these events. Um, he's a heart failure cardiologist uh, uh, with one of the few cardiorenal metabolic specialists in the United States. Um, he's a member of the Arizona Heart Foundation Executive Board and Cardiology Medical Director of School of Ultrasound. And he has numerous passions, including helping the underserved. Um, he's very active in the field of preventive medicine uh, with a nonprofit. And he's also a published author um, of a book, uh, Invoking Your Inner Therapist in Heart Failure. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. And his co-moderator and judge is Dr. Alexis Koskan. Um, she is a PhD from University of South Carolina, Columbia, and postdoctoral fellow um, at Moffitt Cancer Center. And a lot of her work has been around HPV and um, public health. And we're happy to get her involved in um, uh, trying to find solutions for uh, amyloidosis. So. I'll turn it over to you two. Okay, so we are um, going to be debating the question of whether or not you should screen all adults with heart failure over age 65. So we've got our two teams in front of us. We've got our yays and we've got our nays. And the format for tonight is that each group will spend 15 minutes um, presenting their case, in which then after they each present their side, they'll both have time to have a rebuttal um, using the evidence that was presented by the other team. Um, we do have criteria in how we're scoring everyone tonight. Uh, not necessarily in a competitive manner, but just to score the debate, to make it a little more fun, which includes content, delivery, delivery, the quality of slides, analytical thinking, rebuttal and defense, and also audience voting. Um, so everyone gets to participate, including those who are online, in helping to provide some criteria for um, how this, this uh, discussion is reviewed. So with no further... Um, waiting time. <laughs> Sorry, words are escaping me at the moment. Uh, exactly. Um, we will introduce the first team to come up and present their case for screening all adults over age 65 who are living with heart failure um, for this discussion. Buddy, can you guys hear me? All right, let me see. Okay, so that's us. Okay. So when I was, I was sort of thinking, how do I do this? You know, I think uh, Dr. VJ, Dr. Dev said, hey, just just have this debate about pros and cons and. You know, how do we approach this disease as far as like, do we really need to screen this disease? Is this a rare disease? I was like, man, I don't want to break the bank. I'm in primary care. You know, I'm here like every single insurance company. You have to be frugal. You can be spending money. You need to, you know, really best value for the patient. All those lines that we hear from the private sector. I said, if, I, if we screen all this population, we're just going to break the bank. So I think. Why do I want to screen? Who do I want to screen? So I said, I just have to screen just people that meet my criteria for amyloidosis. So I'm thinking um, I want to uh, screen people that are uh, African-American, Western descent, Caribbean, Hispanics, people that come to see me with uh, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, people that have spinal stenosis, people that have HFPEF, the phenotypic HFPEF, and 
and then I also want to screen people that could have the wild variant too. You know, so I, I just going around the room today, I found out that uh, a few people here, yeah, I know this person that died of amyloidosis at age 48. So I went and talked to Susan and said, Dr. Soroff said, yeah, Michael, this is, there is a genetic variant, you know, it's autosomal dominant and, and these people could come earlier than, you know, so I was just thinking, wow, that's just a wild type then. So I even get confused in the primary care, you know, arena, you have to um, kind of organize your thought process when you're trying to see, you know, who do you really screen for, for these disease. Um, I think with the therapies that are available now, it's probably easier to, um, to just justify, you know, just screening for amyloidosis because it really does make a difference. You know, by the time you're diagnosing somebody with amyloidosis, they could have like 2.5 years to live by the time they bounce between doctors. It could be over a year till the diagnosis is rich. Um, definitely not a diagnosis uh, that is hard to, to make if you're thinking about it, if you're aware of it. And, and you know, we have non-invasive testing. It's not that we're just gonna put a patient through like a colonoscopy that have to get prepped, something that is invasive or anything like that. Um, as far as like who to screen, I sort of touched about this a little bit. Um, male patient over the age of 65 with HFPEF, especially Western African descent, black, uh, Caribbean, Hispanics. And then I also think, so let me just organize. So if a patient comes to see me and I think the patient has cardiac amyloidosis, so I think 90% of the time with the diagnosis, with the history that I'm taking, I should be able to make the diagnosis. So patient has like, I'm short of breath, I'm fatigued. My legs are swollen. I mean, I'm struggling with my ADLs. I can't really complete them anymore. You know, get a really good history, see whether they have any orthostatic symptoms, see whether they have, you know, constipation, whether they have impotence, whether they have uh, diarrhea, et cetera. Um, their family history, of course, and just some simple um, um, examination findings, like I've been saying, the carpal tunnel, the spinal stenosis, the Popeye sign, they also could have arthritis of the shoulders, hips, or knees. And and uh, also, when you look at the EKG, the usual pseudo infarct in a pattern, although they could have a lot of other things from, you know, first degree AB blocks to low voltage to AFib to ventricular arrhythmias. So, you know, as far as like screening for, for the disease, it would just use tools like the EKG and the echo and pyrophosphate scanning and free light chain assay. It's probably not expensive, so it's probably worthwhile just going ahead and, and you know, using those uh, affordable, you know, diagnostic testing to be able to uh, reach a diagnosis and finally, you know, pull the trigger. So let me just make sure this is not AL disease versus, you know, cardiac amyloidosis, either wild type or, um, you know, ATTR. Um, um, I touch on this um, and I think this is just a really good point on why should we be very methodic when we are just trying to uh, select those people that we would just screen, you know, uh, just get a very good history on physical examination, get over their family history, past medical history, check their blood work, um, um, check their cardiac enzymes, uh, throw, I forgot the troponin there, definitely check the immunofixation electrophoresis, free light chain assay, 12 lead EKG, echo with strain, PYP scan, and of course at, at this uh, stage, if the free light chain assay is positive, then you're kind of sending over to him along because it really is an emergency. Um, these are some of the things that I would look, you know, when I'm examining the patient, whether they have bicipital tendon dislocation or rupture, and then that's a pyrophosphate scan to the right. Um, you know, that's a positive pyrophosphate scan. The heart optic is just similar to the rib optic that makes it positive. Um, and this is just a macroglos, yeah. And this is just AL amyloidosis. And this is the patients with the periorbital purpura in amyloidosis. So this is how I would screen for the disease. You know, it's not that I'm gonna just be like um, throwing a pyrophosphate scan at everybody that walks into my office with dystonic exertion of heart failure, preserve ejection fraction. This is who the patients that I would definitely 
uh, consider for screening. And that's it. Thank you. So as a cardiologist, uh, we often see patients with constellations of symptoms, and sometimes you have to put things together and it's not so obvious um, that, hey, maybe I'm dealing with this problem. So I kind of put this slide deck together as to how I work up patients when I think that I might have a patient with amyloid. So I'm going to start with a case because I think we all remember very visual learners. And this was actually a patient that I had, a 73-year-old African-American male who had progressive heart failure symptoms over five years. But really, for me, as an interventional cardiologist, every time that I would check his labs, his troponin was positive. So he actually did have a number of hospitalizations, three of them. He kept coming in, his echo kept showing thickened wall, um, and they kept calling it severe LVH. But however, when you see the EKG, it was low voltage. And so why would you have severe LVH? You should have ginormous um, voltage on your EKGs. Again, he was high output. He had JVD up to the angle of the jaw. And when we went and took him to the right heart, to do a right heart, his cardiac index was really low, so he was in, surely was in heart failure. His BNP was elevated, and the troponin that I put in red were always positive. So again, he had hypertension, and he did have chronic kidney disease. He had a carpal tunnel release. That was one of the things that I put together. And then, of course, he had some spine surgery. So when we start thinking about this, I started putting together this had to be something that was going on with something that was depositing in all of these areas. He did have a cath. When I did the cath, he did have some mild disease. 60% um, we would not fix. Uh, we usually do 70 and above. His EF was 30, 40%. It was globally down. But again, um, it was first moderate, and then he became severe in LVH. And although his wedge pressure, everything kept going up, and he was diagnosed all along with ischemic cardiomyopathy. So he was put on heart failure meds. But of course, those medicines do not do anything for this problem. Once he started getting the spinal stenosis and the carpal tunnel, I said, we need to start figuring out what's going on. And then we actually did an SPEP and a UPEP, and he got, he got diagnosed with ATTR amyloid. It was not ever considered, and then we did the endomyocardial biopsy. And certainly, we did genetic testing, and he did have a genetic variant for this um, type of, um, of, of amyloid. So, Basically, one of the things that I read about is that a lot of patients in the United States that are underdiagnosed, there's probably 44 million people in the United States, and the prevalence of this disease is about 3.5%. We think that there's a lot of carriers. We think that over age 65, there's probably around 200,000 people that have been diagnosed. And this is just from census, from research, from different papers, and I have all my, um, my my uh, sources here. But males, again, 70% compared to females. It's genetic. It's an autosomal dominant pattern. And there's lots of genes now that they're identified, usually chromosome 18. There's going to be some um, diagnoses of that. So there are two main types of amyloid that affect the heart. There's the AL and then there's the ATTR. The ATTR is, is what we're really going to focus on because we have actually treatment and it actually changes lives. The AL is going to be in the hematology realm because that's a very poor prognosis. It comes from the bone marrow, comes from plasma cells, and it's isolated. Um, it is also hereditary, but it's going to be the light chain amyloidosis. And those actually don't have a very good prognosis at all. But if you actually have the ATTR, either the wild type or or the hereditary, we have lots of treatment options. And so you don't want to make you don't want to miss this diagnosis. It's just like thinking, do I have a pulmonary embolism? If you do think it, you start them on blood thinners until you prove that they don't have it. So you got to think about these diagnoses in these patients. 
So what actually happens? So there is a protein called transthyretin. It is the transport protein of thyroxine and retinol. It's a binding protein. It has four identical monomers, and it used to be called prealbumin, and you could still see it in the lab. But it is a abnormal uh, tetramer that forms, and the, the, the protein actually folds on itself. And when it folds on itself, it makes amyloid fibrils. It can, it can be deposited in any of the tissues. So we have the wild type and the variant type. The wild type is not hereditary. The median age is 74. 25% of patients will have this on, on autopsy. So again, we're diagnosing that this is a very underdiagnosed problem. The variant or the genetic is hereditary. It's autosomal dominant, and it's more of a late onset. So again, we have a cont we have a uh, continuum. When you first see this, patients may be asymptomatic. The septum starts growing large, and then it's going to go bigger and bigger and bigger. And once you start having more problems, you're going to see atrial fibrillation, conduction disease problems. And these are all the people that walk into my clinic on a daily basis, complaining of shortness of breath. We're seeing a ton of AFib. And over the course of the years, then we're missing, at the end, it's this full-blown ATTR cardiomyopathy. So this is what a heart looks like with amyloid. When you actually have the infiltration, you can see the infiltrated heart with the amyloid fibrils. And what happens is it impairs contraction. And so you actually don't, you get heart failure, even though you have a big, thick heart, it can't pump. It does not work well. So what are some of the signs? Again, chest pain, shortness of breath, edema, especially in the lower legs. We see this all the time as cardiologists. In, uh, exercise intolerance, AFib, aortic stenosis. These are people that should be screened for sure for this. Now, if they add other symptoms, eye floaters, spinal stenosis, carpal tunnel syndrome, bilaterally, ascites, all of these add, as Mike said, to the diagnosis that they should, these patients should be screened. So if somebody over age 65 starts coming in with these symptoms, of course, we want to do it. GI complaints. Uh, I'm just going to keep going. So here's the EKG, because it's going to be a very thick wall, but you can see very low voltage. All of these are less than one box, so it's a low voltage for the opposite of what you're going to see when you're actually looking at the heart. And here's what LVH looks like up on top, and this is what amyloid looks like. So it's a much different EKG. So you could see a parasternal long axis of my EK echo of the amyloid. This is an amyloid heart. And I'm going to show you, at, you could see that it's hardly pumping, although the walls are really thick. You have biatrial enlargement. These are some of the signs. And then, of course, a restrictive filling pattern. So they have diastolic heart failure. They are non-compliant. So some of the issues are that there's a lot of things that are mimics. This is the PYPP scan. When you actually want to make the diagnosis, we have something called the Perugini score, and you're going to compare it to the uptake in the ribs. If it's equal to the rib, it's likely positive. But if it's greater than the rib, this is the heart, you have a positive scan. So I just want to show you one last thing. Heart failure and amyloid can coexist. Hypertension and amyloid can coexist. You want to think of all of these diagnoses. This is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right on this side. This is amyloid heart, and it looks very similar. You have a hypertension heart with someone with renal failure, and this is somebody with lysosomal storage disease. So although we're seeing all these patients come in, it's very similar presentations on echo. And so you want to have the ability to test these patients. So again, why should we screen? Because it's life-threatening, it's progressive, it's infiltrative. Early diagnosis is key. We have treatment. We have uh, treatment options. It's easy to misdiagnose, but if you put it all together, you can make this treatment and make their lives much better. Again, a lot of the routine medicines for heart failure do not work in these patients. And so you, since there are drugs that are going to thwart the progression, my, my thing would be we're screening for so many other things. I think that we should just go ahead, screen patients. You have to have a gestalt that you think this is going on and there are findings, but you really want to actually make the diagnosis. You don't want to miss it.